wearing shorts outside. Now we're all bundling up. I, so you know, he had plenty of other things to do tonight, I'm sure, but to come here tells me a lot about this, this topic. It's of intrinsic interest to parents. I'm a parent myself. And so uh, dealing with now with a first grader and a third grader. And so I have to put what I now tr teach to educators and parents into practice. And you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that's quite interesting. What I say now, I have to actually back it up by actually doing it at home. So I can t what the purpose of today is, is to give you an overview of something that's very important. It's stress and management. Oh, by the way, how many of you have ever experienced stress before? <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. So I'm not speaking just by myself. Yes. Stress, of course, it's ubiquitous. It's in everything that we do. I want to walk through um, the idea of what perhaps students are experiencing when we think about stress and anxiety. But first of all, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of health. We all talked about health. Let's go back 250 years ago, even in Cincinnati, Ohio. What do you think the life expectancy was back in 250 years ago in Cincinnati, Ohio? Yeah, you're pretty close. You're actually overshooting the mark a little bit. It's from the early 30s. But if you think about why that would be, 250 years ago, if you got a cut, what happened? Infection. Yeah, you better pray you didn't get it infected, right? What about the water, the air quality? So the idea of health at that point was just basically survival. That's all we were trying to do. There really wasn't much else we could do. The advent of the, of course, the turn of last century, with the advent of antibiotics, among other things, it significantly propelled our health and our idea of what health is. Until so about the 1970s, when we had a lot of diseases eradicated or controlled in many respects, we begin to think about health beyond just survival, beyond just idea of mortality. And we went from trying to survive to life meaning. And what that meant was we got to think about some other domains that are important to our lives. Things like, that was coming up here, mental and emotional and, and social awareness and academic dimensions. All these things became and came at the forefront about 50 years ago. Fast forward to today, they still are. More importantly, we really start thinking very seriously about these. How many of you are parents? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You all have children. What are the skills you want your child to have when they're 18 and older? Can you just tell me? What are the skills you want? To be independent. Independent, good. To be happy, what else? Very good. Problem, Problem solvers. Resilient, which means? Being able to cope. Be able to cope. Social awareness. Social skills. Social skills, picking up social cues, critical thinking. Healthy. Being healthy. Confidence, personal accountability could be another one. It's really interesting because I've done this for decades. I, I know I look like I'm 16, but I've done this for decades. I've asked teachers, I've asked uh, leaders, uh, legislators, I've asked parents the same question. And nobody has ever said, in, in how ironic we're in schools, nobody's ever said, I want my child to be the best reader they possibly can be. I want them to master algebra. That's part and parcel of what we do, but that's not the ultimate end goal for what we want our children to be, right? We want them to have all of these skills. You know, however, the problem is, is that when stress interferes with that, it not only interferes with learning, it interferes with the very skills we want as parents to have our children. So what can we do to do to help? And that's what today is all about. The idea is thinking health beyond just this idea of this dimension of survival and perhaps mastering one domain but thinking about the child in totality. And we don't think about health anymore as this either or thing. We think about along a continuum. And the reason I want to bring this idea up is that there's meaning behind this wellness continuum. We've actually collected uh, data about this. And so what we have found when we map academic outcomes to this wellness, I'm going to look right here, this average wellness. It's nice to be average. There's nothing wrong with average. But we've collected data, and we've mapped it along here, and for every step downward in this continuum, your GPA, for example, goes down by as much as 15%. Your state test scores go down. So there's meaning even behind average to optimal. What can we do, and why, aren't, why isn't every child, every student, every individual, why are they not at the optimal range? Now, there's a number of factors, but the most important factors are stress and anxiety. That's what seems to, if you really want to bring it down, of course there's other things we can think about, depression and everything else, but stress and anxiety seems to be this thread that will, it's woven across. 
So that's what the purpose of today is. The purpose is just to give you a brief overview of stress and anxiety and its impact on student development. Now, I say student development, but most, most of the things I'm going to say to you is going to apply to all of us. As one of the other things I do, I'm affiliated with the UC Stress Center. You familiar with the UC Stress Center? If you're not, I, I, I want to do this because this is very important. It specializes in PTSD. We're going to spend a very snippet, a very small snippet about PTSD, but PTSD it's a pervasive thing. And until about six years ago, there really wasn't a good place in this community where you can get good treatment for PTSD. Now, are you familiar with Joey Votto? Okay, Joey, Joey Votto, he gave a lot of money to the stress center to get it started. And this is very important because what he wanted to do is he wanted to pay for the services even if a family, an individual, couldn't afford it themselves. It's 558. 5872 is the general information line. If you have or concerns about anything, somebody you know, some, perhaps you or your child, give us a call. We'll be able to help you with that. 558-5872, we specialize in PTSD, and we treat everybody. We treat students from uh, age 13 up to 95 right now. We have somebody that are at 95. So it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter whether they can afford it or not. We'll be able to pay for it. So I want to make sure that's my community service to you. So thanks a lot. Have a good night. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the idea of what we can do to help in terms of empirically based suggestions, things that you can try at home. Now, I'm a psychologist. I'm one of these guys that could talk about what we do in therapy. But you know, a lot of the stuff that we do in therapy are the very things you could apply at home and in the classrooms that we do already. So I want to make these suggestions pragmatic, but effective. So I want to leave the end of this session, the end of this hour, to talk about some of the things you can try at home that seem to be important. But as you can probably tell from my annoying nasal twang, I am not from here. I am from South Dakota. How many of you are from South Dakota? <laughs> How many of you have ever seen the state of South Dakota? Good for you. So there's actually three people who live in South Dakota, and since I'm here, we have to shut the state down for eight hours. I usually get a better laugh than that. This is not going very well. <laughs> so um, the reason I bring that up is after about 15 minutes of hearing myself talk, I start to annoy me. So please, I want this to be a, mon a dialogue, not a monologue. If you have questions, raise your hand. I'm happy to help. All right? So, let's talk about stress. Of course, stress is inevitable. We can't escape stress. We can't escape adversity. And actually, a certain amount of stress is normal. It's important for us. We can't do very well without a little bit of stress in our life. Of course, that's for students as well. For those of us who remember back then, when we had to cram for a test, there was a little bit of element that was important. That stress is important. We cannot avoid stress. So we have a, perhaps our child that seems to be overwhelmed with their stress and we're a little concerned about, God, if I add one more thing, it's going to topple them over the edge. So what's our natural inclination to do? Don't give it to them. Right? And that's reasonable. But what are we actually teaching our students or our children? Avoidance is not cope. Remember those skills you guys just mentioned right at the beginning stages? How does that help us with those ultimate skills by having them avoid the stresses? The goal for us is to help the student work through whatever stresses they face. That's resiliency, right? So that's the important thing I want to make sure of. One of the key things about anxiety and the key things about stress is avoidance. And I'll walk you through why that is. There's an evolutionary reason why we want to avoid sometimes. Yeah, the, that added level of stress. But the important thing is we don't want to have somebody avoid it. We want to teach them the skills to work through the problem. Um, the beneficial aspects, of course, of stress, they greatly diminish if they are overwhelming. So I'm not talking about positive stress. I'm not talking about these points of adversity. How many of us have ever experienced adversity in our lives? Maybe it's more important. How many of us have never experienced adversity? Good. Good, okay, we're all realists. Of course, adversity is important. Let me ask you another question. Did you learn more about yourself and perhaps the world because of that adverse experience, or did you learn more when you were most comfortable? Adversity, adversity of course. It's a, it's a great teaching moment as long as it's controlled, of course. We're all going to experience adversity. It's one thing to experience, and it's another thing that it overwhelms the individual. 
Uh, so one of the things I'm, worrying, I'm talking about is positive stress. These are adver adverse experiences. Typically, it's short-lived. We learn from it. It may not be pretty in the moment, but we learn th from it. And the other thing, of course, is tolerable stress. These are even more intense. Again, relatively, the experience is relatively short-lived. How many of you have ever lost a, a parent? Right? When you were in that moment when you lost a parent, you probably really couldn't see beyond that. It was so difficult to do that. And if somebody was to say, was, it was to tell you it's going to get better, it was hard to see that. But it was short-lived. And believe it or not, we lived through this. We learned something about ourselves and others. I'm not even talking about those experiences. I'm talking about this chronic, toxic stress, these intensive, adverse experiences sustained over a period of time, over and over and over. These are the areas that I'm really focusing on when I speak of toxic stress. Now, when we experience a child or our students or among other things, we see them become overwhelmed, and we often think about, <laughs> what are you getting so upset about? This is not a big deal. But I want to walk you through, because there's a perception, at least with stress and anxiety, it's all in our minds. But there are physiological reasons why this happens. And so I don't have a whiteboard, so I typically would draw the picture of the brain to walk you through. But I'll use this diagram of the brain to walk you through three specific areas that are implicated in anxiety and stress. It happens. All right, how many of you have children that actually go to the school? How many times have you driven to this school? More times than you can think of? Was this the same route you drove tonight as normal? Yeah? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Is done? <laughs> All right. Can you tell me every step of the way in that car to here? Can you tell me everything you did? Would you say that because it's been so ingrained in your memory, you were able to shut parts of your brain off to do other things, maybe listen to music, talk on the phone, if you're my wife, put on the makeup in the morning, whatever it is, but you turn parts of your brain off. That's normal, right? But let's say, for instance, this morning when you were driving your student off, or you were just driving yourself, you're driving along and you see a red car, we'll just call it a red car, a red car going a little too fast at an intersection you're about ready to reach. What are you going to do? You're going to do a behavior. You're going to stop the car. You're going to say, oh, well, I'm being videotaped, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what are you going to do first? You're not even aware you're doing it. That's the behavior. You're going to slow down. That's another behavior. Exactly. You are going to focus on that red car. Are you aware that you're doing it? No. No, you're not aware you're doing it at all. It's taking over for you. It's happening right about here. Now, I, call, I, I point out right here, if you just take your finger and go up your spine to where you, the back of your head meets, that's where it all begins. It's a brain stem. That's part of a, of a larger structure, but that's the brain stem. The brain stem is responsible for doing things you're not even aware of, your heartbeat, your pulse, your respiration, all that other stuff. Meaning that if you damage this thing, it doesn't matter if the rest of your brain is fine. You're kind of dead, not to be morbid about this. So what is it really ultimately responsible for? Survival. Survival, very good. Keeping you alive. And one of the ways it's going to keep you alive is you're constantly searching for threats. Anything unpredictable, out of the ordinary, unanticipated, is going to make you attend to it. You don't even know you're doing it. You just do it. And you know, when that thing does it, I call it buzzing. It starts to buzz. Mm -hmm. Right? means threat. So when that red car was coming, you're going to immediately attend to it, and if I was to microscopically insert you into your brainstem, you would see it buzz. You know, every organism has a brainstem. It doesn't matter how complex they are. They have a brainstem. It's the oldest part of our brain. And when that thing buzzes, most organisms are programmed to do one thing. Let's see if we have it. I'll test you guys. If a lion is threatened, what's a lion going to do? <laughs> Uh, I was expecting more, but that, let's try this one. Gazelle. Fly. Good, good. Possum. Yeah. They get accused, too. They play dead. Flight, flight freezes right in this area. Now, it's close. It's linked to other areas, but that's where it begins. You know what's really interesting about human beings is that we have the tendency to do one of those three. We know one of those three, but through genetic heritage and, and maybe how we observed ourselves, we typically do one of the three, not all the time. So how many of you are married? 
And how many of you, when you get into an argument with your spouse, what's your natural tendency? How many of you want to fight back by arguing? <laughs> how many of you just say, I don't want to deal with this? And, and uh, last time I did this, one of the males said, I just freeze. <laughs> Wait for the next instruction from my spouse. <laughs> fight, fight, freeze. That's where it begins. You know what? I, I, I mentioned um, that was a physical thing, wasn't it? That, that car. But most of the things that we experience with our students, or even when we get upset, how many times are we being physically threatened? So, you know what's interesting about this brainstem? It doesn't care. It doesn't know what the difference between a physical threat and a psychological threat is. It just sees threat. It doesn't know if it's real or if it's memory. You know, a lot of us times we, we, we think about something. And that can elicit that threat. It doesn't care. It just sees threat because it's unpredictable, unanticipated. It will threaten. It will try to program you to respond. So I think about these things. And uh, I'm writing a book right now. Uh, and the book is, is talking about what I think are the universal rules of human behavior. And there's, I, I could help, you can help me out. Can you help me out here? Because I have this argument with my wife. I say there are three fundamental human rules that if any one of these things are violated, that's usually when we get upset, because it's a threat to our survival. The need to look good, the need to be right, and the need to belong. Think about any time, last time you guys got, a, any one of you got upset, which one of those rules was being violated? Need to look good, need to be right, need to belong. Now my wife argues with me, she says, You're, you've missed another one, the need for fairness, or the need for justice. So which one is right, me or my wife? Oh, I, I see, I always knew that. You ever, I mean, never had anybody say, you're right, Dr. Gilman, and your wife is completely wrong. But between me and you and that video camera that's taken me, can we just say I'm right? Good, I'll tell her that. So the need to look good, the need to be right, the need to belong, and the need for fairness, any one of those things sends us into a tizzy. Bzz. Now that's the setting stage. That's not anxiety. That's just the setting stage. What happens next is right in this area right here, um, it's a little bit newer than our brain stem. Um, if you don't do this at home, but if you take a, take a pencil and go about six inches down from the top of your brain, you'll find it. And it is about an eighth of your thumbnail. I mean, it's really, really small, really, really powerful. Well, have anybody of you, any one of you ever seen the movie Inside Out? Mm -hmm. Tell me the characters of Inside, only two of you? You guys gotta get out more. All right, so tell me the characters of Inside Out, for those of you who've seen it. Joy? Joy sadness, sadness? Anger. I heard anger? Fear? Fear? Disgust. Disgust, good, you got them. Those are the basic, what we think of, are, are, those are the basic emotions. Our brain, or our emotional center, is, again, because it's relatively old, it, it can't process all of them. It really has five primary emotions, and that's what I love about uh, Inside Out. I don't have to spend 45 minutes talking about it. You just remember the characters. Those are the basic ones. It's not like those are the only ones we have. So think of a color palette. We have secondary emotions, too. What do you think jealousy is? What's a combination of? Anger plus? Yeah, that's, that's what we think. It's anger plus fear. So it's combinations. But more importantly, when this thing starts buzzing, it automatically sends an impulse to our emotional center. Let's say, let's put yourself back in that car. You're about ready to hit that intersection. Here comes that red car at you. What's the emotion you're probably going to experience? I would hope fear. Yeah, right. Completely rational to be <laughs> fearful in that moment. That's the key, right? What was happening is that that thing was going... Ah! And because it was doing that, it really carved a channel to the fear network. So let's say, for instance, you didn't get hit, thank goodness, but tomorrow you're driving, you see another red car. Not that red car. It doesn't even have to be the shade of that car, but a red nonetheless. What emotion are you going to experience? Fear. It wasn't going any fast. It's just the idea of looking at that made this thing go bzzz. And because it already carved a channel to your fear network, it's easy to experience the same emotion again. You know, that is so powerful. There's been studies, and they have been conducted, where we have put 65- and 7-year-old individuals in an fMRI. Are you familiar with an MRI? Right, that small little tube that if you're claustrophobic, good luck to you. Makes weird noises. 
An fMRI is the same thing, but it can see your brain doing things in real time. So we've taken these 65 and 7 year olds, we've put them into the, um, to the tube. Now these 65 and 7 year olds, they've had horrific experiences when they were actually age 10. So this is well over half a century later. Maybe it was a car accident, maybe it was sexual assault. It doesn't matter what it was, but they experienced something over half a century later. We asked them one question. What happened to you when you were 10? Simple. And as they were relaying the story, you literally see that connection being made. Remember when I said it's not just in your mind? There are physiological connections that are happening. Remember, this doesn't know whether it's real, whether it's imagined, it just sees threat. And it will respond in kind. That's the important thing. All right, so here's where the problem is and here's where the solution is. The problem is, if you take your finger, you don't have to, but it's your temples on out, what is that called? The frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the thing that defines us as human beings. It is the most complex thing in the universe. There is nothing that can, can beat this. Now, if that's indeed the case, and by the way, it doesn't fully develop until mid-20s, what is it responsible for? You're doing it. Cognition. Yeah. Thinking. It's the boss of everything else. It is able to keep our emotions in check if we allow it. So, I don't know if you're familiar with this um, bakery called Bone Bonery. Sorry, I had a little, my French came out. <laughs> bon bonnery. <laughs> All right, bon bonnery. So I drive by bon bonnery every day on the way to work. And most of the time, I'm going to go in and I'm going to get myself a coffee and an opera cream cupcake. And if you haven't had one of their opera cream cupcakes, you are missing out. You got to try it. But every once in a while, because I've eaten too many <laughs> opera cream cupcakes, I got to go on a diet. So I'll get my coffee and then I'll reach for the opera cream cupcake, and then this thing kicks in and says, you only got so many calories in a day, why would you be wasting it on an opera cream? And that's enough for me to stop. So emotionally, I want that, but this is, an, this is able to kind of stop that from happening. Now that's when we are, this is firing, but here's the problem. Remember when this thing is going bzzz, and it lings it? If our emotions get so strong, it literally sends an impulse to our frontal lobe and says, shut down, don't think. Don't think at all. You ever been in a situation where you've been so emotional, doesn't matter why, I could have came up to you and asked you to spell your name and you would have had a really hard time doing that? Yeah, I know, am I the only one? <laughs> That's what it is. Your frontal lobe is shut down. It's, your, your emotions have hijacked your frontal lobe. Now why in the world would that be? Why when we need our frontal lobe to be firing, is it shut down? Can you think of any time when it's probably worthwhile not to think? How many of you are athletes? Or how we're athletes? It's the worst thing you can do on a field. doesn't matter if it was a baseball or a football. What's, what's the worst thing that your coach has always told you not to do? Why? Because you start trying to anticipate what's going to happen rather than just do it. Exactly. Now that's a coach. Now let's put us all in this situation. You're running in a jungle and the lion's chasing after you. Besides tripping, what's the worst thing you could possibly do? Stop and, if I go here, or should I go here? That nanosecond of thinking is enough time for the lion to catch up and eat you. This is an evolutionary thing that's going on right now. Essentially what this is saying is that when this is firing and your emotions get too strong, that's evolution. All you're trying to do is survive. Again, it doesn't have to be a physical threat. In the moments of those psychological threats, the need to look good, the need to be right, the need to belong, the need for justice, those things can be some, so powerful for that individual, this just wants to get you out and survive another day. The reason I'm bringing this up is how many times do you reason with your child when they're in those moments? Using your words, talking to them, how many times do you do that? I'm not being critical because I do the same thing. And how effective is that? It's not. Nah, is it? They're not willing to listen to you. Why aren't they willing to listen to you? Exactly, it's shut down. They're not willing to listen to you. They're not thinking. Okay, I just lied to you. 
won't be the first time I lied to you today, but I lied to you. It's not like they don't think. They do think. They're just not using their frontal lobe. They're using another part of their brain, and I draw it up for you. I call it a negative tape loop, and that'll tell you how old I am if I'm referencing negative tape loop. All right? A negative tape loop is essentially, we all have them. It's not just our kids. We all have them. Our negative tape loops is kind of like a chest we've been carrying around since we can consciously remember. And it's all this, all this stuff we've been saying about ourselves and what we think others have told us and all that. And we've been carrying that around, and none of it's pretty. Have you ever hit your shin on a coffee table? What do you tell yourself besides ouch? Why and what do you... Stupid? Yeah, this is stupid. Otherwise known as or implied as, I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. Right? Really strong stuff. Not necessarily true, but in that moment, those are those negative tape loop thoughts. How many of you time, how many times have you worked with your child trying to understand what they're saying and they're telling you negative tape loop thoughts? Things like never, this always. If I do this, this is what's going to happen. Those are negative tape loop thoughts. So it's not like we don't think, we do think, but we're not using our frontal lobe. And they're automatic thoughts. We don't even know what's in that chest. Point of it is, however, is how many times do we try to talk the student or talk your child down? Oh, come on, that's not true. And how often does that help? I'm only setting the stage of reality the way we see it. It's just who we are. But please know that there are physiological reasons why we do what we do. We just don't do it. By the way, can I tell you the secret of life? Hello? Can I talk to you the secret of life? Now, I can't really, I can't draw it here, but I'll walk it through. Here's a, here's a quiz for you. Do you think that we do behaviors just for the sake of doing the behavior? We just impulsively do it. Or are there reasons why we do our behaviors? Yeah. We may not know what those reasons are. But they do happen nonetheless. Let's label that A. A is the events. So at the beginning of every behavior, which is down, downstream, something has to cause. It could be a memory, it could be a statement, it could be something, but it's an A nonetheless. And here's where we get it wrong, in my opinion, especially therapists. <laughs> we get this wrong, because we want to focus on your feelings. Tell me how you feel. Label your feelings for me. Yeah, so you can do that. And most of us think that A will automatically lead to a feeling. Let's label that C. C is our feelings. The five emotions I'm talking about. A leads to C. I'm missing a letter. What's a letter? What do you think B is? No, B behavior is the end, end result, but that was good. You're doing it. For those of you who are still with me. <laughs> You're thinking, yeah. right. The secret of life is A leads to B leads to C. An event leads us to tell ourselves something about it. And that automatically, whatever we tell ourselves, leads to an emotion. And whatever that emotion is leads to the behavior. The goal is less about C, our feelings, because that's just a natural output of what we tell ourselves. If we can get ourselves to consciously start thinking about what is in that negative tape loop, We've got half the game won because we are thinking. Does that make sense? So rather than trying to talk your student down or your, your child down, this is what I do. And this is what we do all the time. And this is what I teach all the time. One simple question. What are you telling yourself right now? You now, why would I have? Why would you want to do that? A simple question, neutral question. What are you telling yourself right now? Why would you want to do that instead? Exactly. First of all, they're not used to that. You just threw them a curveball. You throw them a curveball, whatever motion they're in automatically stops because they're expecting you to do what you've been doing, right? Which is talking them out, whatever else it is. What are you telling yourself right now is forcing them to go. And that's all you need for them to get this back online. More importantly, it allows them, it teaches them a new skill. And the skill is, what am I thinking? Because if you can get them to identify whatever that thought is, whatever that ugly thought is, again, you got at this point about 70% of the battle won. Make sense? All right. So I just want to walk you through the physiological reasons of why anxiety and stress often can feel overwhelming because they are overwhelming.
them because this thing, this very thing that will walk them through solving the problem, i.e. the skills we want to teach them, is down, it's shut down. We've got to get it back online. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I'll walk you through some skills in which we hijack this whole evolutionary process. All right, any questions? Because I'm thirsty, I'm going to get myself something to drink. Yeah? Well, if you want to get into, that's a really good question. You know, I have a, I'm a first grader. We were doing this when they were in kindergarten. Not going to get you much. You know, you're not going to get yourself a nice talk. But more importantly for younger kids, it's what can we do to de-escalate that, that connection that's being formed. Typically, when you get these negative take loops, that any child, any age can get you that. But to discuss it, among other things that I'll teach you in 15 minutes, it's usually around sixth grade or so. But you never can tell a precocious child, and I've worked with a number of them, much younger, and they are able to not only identify, but to challenge that thought. Good question. Others, before I go on? Is there ever a time that you can make your child think too much? Yeah, give me a little bit more, because I like that. Uh, overthinking. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not so much that it's overthinking, it's what are you thinking about, right? That's the key. And typically, this is the problem with the negative tape loop. Again, we don't know what's in that negative tape loop, and it's all this stuff. And it's easy to, these negative tape loops, these things we've been storing, the most recent ones are fresh, so we're able to do that. But if they don't work, we'll just keep digging down. We'll go, we'll go way back in our past. This oldy, moldy, smelly stuff, doesn't matter. If, it, if the shoe fits, we'll apply it. We're really good about beating ourselves up. I don't know why. And what's going on here? Let's say, for instance, what my thing is I violated that rule of looking good. I know I'm not looking good right now, right? And if your parent comes at me very well meaning and tries to interject yourself into that, what could I possibly be interpreting that as? I don't look good, and now I got my parent coming to me to tell me this. Um, so you see how it can perpetuate? And now we're into this whole spinning thing, and that's what's going on. It basically, that tape loop, I'll just put it right here, does this. Now we're kind of like in a hurricane. And nowhere in this thing, as long as it's doing that, are we able to activate the frontal lobe. We've got to do something to activate the frontal lobe. And the way to do that is not by overthinking. It's just simply by asking that. That stops that loop from going on. Make sense? The idea is understanding what are you telling yourself at that point. Okay. So, oh, everything I just told you is now in animation. Isn't that great? <laughs> I did that myself. I was very proud of myself. It's the only <laughs> thing I know how to do. So, I'll, I'll, real quickly here, and I mean, you could we could all admire it for a while, but more importantly, let's talk about these physiological changes due to the to, to the toxic stress itself, it can disrupt neural circuitry. The most important one is uh, cortisol. Are you familiar with cortisol? 20 years ago, we wouldn't have known cortisol. Cortisol is one of these things that's probably one of the most uh, well-researched output of our anxiety or hormone, among other things. Of course, there's adrenaline. Just think about that time when you've gotten so upset. And what's happening, it's not just these connections being made. You know, our stress hormones are going on. A little bit goes a long way, and we need a little bit. If you've ever competed in anything, it doesn't have to be an athletic event. It could just be something. Maybe even a game with your brother who's a little bit more competitive than you want to be, and now is the time I'm going to beat him. You're going to have a little cortisol, and that's going to be good. But the longer that somebody is in this sustained cortisol level, that's not exactly the best. How many of you are in high-stress jobs right now? And it doesn't have to be, it's your perceptions of stress, but high stress jobs. Teachers, I think teachers are in a very high stress job. And I ask teachers this all the time. I ask them, when is the, when you get out of school? And they'll tell you the date, right? When when you guys get out of school? Is it May 31st or whatever? Okay. And I ask, I ask the same thing. I go, okay, that's the date that you get out of school, but when does your body know that school is finally done? How long do you think it takes? Yeah, 
But on average, it takes two weeks. So yes, the body, or the, we tell ourselves, yeah, okay, woohoo, I'm out for school, but I'm still kind of geared up for the next two weeks. Why is that? Yeah. Think about a teaching, a life of a teacher, or anything else we're doing that work with people. Can we really predict human behavior to a point where we know that Jimmy, this day, Jimmy's going to do this, Johnny's going to do this? We don't know. So we're always prepared for the unanticipated. And any time that we prepare for an unanticipated, that cortisol level shoots a little bit more. How many of you have push mowers? Yeah, okay. Got that little, what is it, a car primer? That little bubble, right? So this is interesting because we find this out at the stress center. Um, and I can't, I can't chart it, but I'll show you through my own pantomime. Now let's say, for instance, when we have an individual come in, and the great thing about the stress center is that we can reduce PTSD symptoms to below diagnostic threshold in 13 weeks or less. 13 weeks or less is all it takes to help somebody. It's one of the most recoverable of the disorders. We used to think it wasn't. But I'll tell you, this, so typically, when they come in, here's stress level, stress level is really high. And within five weeks, we see it, come, we see it go down like this, right? I feel like a meteorologist here. So we see it go down, but we, you know what's interesting? Within between weeks five and seven, we actually see an increase in panic attacks, a physiological thing. Sometimes they have to be admitted to the hospital. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen. And it's gotten to the point where we can anticipate, ooh, I think that's what's going on. So why is it that they're getting better, and yet their body is saying, no, 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 uh -uh. Yeah, we, we, we kind of got a handle on this one because we were you know, consulting. Look, our brains say, I'm getting better. Psychologically, I'm getting better. But it takes a while for the body to catch up. And if we've been living all this time with this cortisol level at that level, it doesn't matter us finally cognitively saying, okay, I understand what my tape loop is. It takes a little bit for the body to catch up to get rid of that excessive cortisol. And I think the same principle applies for those of us who are at a high stress job and go on vacations. Do we really enjoy those short term vacations? No, I'm still sleeping pretty poorly for the first three days I'm on vacation. The body doesn't know. Make sense? Anyway, just a little tip. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, in the interest of time, that's an excellent question. I do have some things we're going to talk about that seem to be triggered, seem to be triggered by puberty. I will say that a lot of these studies that have actually looked at you know, hormone levels, among other things, very small end sizes, but there's enough of these studies now. I wouldn't have been able to say this 15 years ago, but there's enough studies to kind of get a better picture of the role, perhaps, of puberty as it plays. So, for example, social cues. And I'm living that now with my two kids, you know. They're not really picking up the social cues, especially from their parents. But my oldest is starting to really pick up social cues from his peers. He's more sensitive to it. And he's about ready to enter that stage. And there is some studies that suggest that the one part of the brain that does change through puberty is the one part that picks up social cues, more sensitive to that. Very things that when we were younger we didn't care. Now we do. And um, they can often be misinterpreted. So if you have preteens, you maybe you agree with me, but um, the very things two years ago, I go, what are you so upset about? Yeah, there's reasons why they're upset. And they think that the, so the, one of the triggers is the pubertal hormones that kick in. All right. I want to talk a little bit about chronic stress and its impact on learning. You may have heard this term ACEs. You may not have. ACEs, is, it's not new. It's been around for quite some time. It probably is the most, um, uh, well, it is one of the largest studies that have actually looked at the impact of stress in the form of trauma, traumatic experiences, on outcomes. <laughs> and uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is that there's still follow-up studies on this one, and we use this to kind of glean what does stress look like and, uh, and its impact on learning and development. So. Um, 
uh, it is the largest study of its kind. The only problem with this study, it's all retrospective. It was asking adults to look back on their life and report the number of adverse child experiences, i.e. ACEs. And when they did that, they were able to um, categorize into really three groups. One, of course, is abuse, physical, emotional, and sexual, and then neglect. And then the, all the other things that individuals are reporting, for example, if my parent was incarcerated, of course, that's a very adverse experience. And so over there you have the outcomes. Um, you know, it went from basically no adverse experiences of those 17,000 to 12.5% of those individuals experiencing four or more. And there was a correlation between the number of adverse experiences and outcomes. So I want to point that out. So for example, one of the biggest things about stress, i.e. trauma in this case, is that it impacts all kinds of memory. And of course, if we think about learning, we think about academic achievement, memory is a huge component. And what we know is that these ongoing stress, toxic stress levels can affect that memory center. What we were finding here is it's not just one form of memory, it's multiple memories. More importantly, if I can get this baby to work, let's take a look at education outcomes themselves. So you may have it in front of you, but it was looking at the number of events and who actually graduates. Look, 50 years ago, my father didn't graduate from high school, so 50 years ago, it wasn't such a big thing. He did fine with his life. It is huge. You have to have your high school degree. But in terms of this outcome, and this is relatively recent, what group up there is most likely not to graduate from high school? Those who have multiple adverse child experiences. Now here's the problem I have with these studies. There's nothing wrong with it, by the way. Here's the problem I have. is that It's a correlational study. It's looking at the number versus. But what you're also finding, it could be one. It could be a big one. If I'm in a car accident in a near-death experience, Oh yeah, that's going to affect me quite a lot. So it may not necessarily be the number, it may be the intensity of the experience itself that does the same thing. And more and more research is coming out to, to support that. Everything's retrospective, but follow-up studies we're looking at percentage of children with adverse experiences who are currently expecting or experiencing significant academic problems. And again, there's a correlation. The more adverse child experiences there are, the more ac dire academic outcomes there are. So there is a difference, there is a huge thing. Now I'm talking about traumatic experiences. That's, I wanna make sure I'm under, you're understanding that. I'm talking about stress, heightened levels. But I'm also, one of the biggest criticisms I have about this is what was being reported by these 17,000 individuals and what is missing. What is an important part of your child's life in all of our child's life? Think of those three, I'm gonna say three, three universal rules, and one of those is missing. What do you think it is? We've got the physical, we've got the emotional. What's missing? Thinking. No. Safety. We're all together. Social. Social is huge, right? The need to belong. There are fundamental things in our brains that are wired to protect against the threat. Even the thought of being ostracized makes this thing go <laughs> threat. The social connections, and the reason I want to do this is that social rejection is one of the most strongest and most common traumatic stressful experiences. I'm bringing that up because most of my research right now is looking at this, the power of social connections and lack thereof. Well, let's say for instance, <sighs> we all hang out for, for a week. We all go to Great Wolf Lodge and have a great time. And in that week, I had just observed you. Now, when we first start out, we're all kind of seeing each other. And that, at, at the end of the week, do you think we're all going to be lovey-dovey with each other as one group? <laughs> Human nature being what it is, we're going to start gravitating to people that we like, we have commonalities, and we're not going to like others. That's just the way it is. If I was to map you all, I would give you a questionnaire. I'd say, who are you hanging out with? Tell me who you hang out with. And it would be a spider web. That's what it would look like. And the reason I bring this up is I'm big into the analysis of social networks. Not social networking. I don't even have Facebook because I don't know how to program that thing. But the idea of connection <clears throat> and where they are and why that's so important. So in South Dakota, as I mentioned where I'm from, there's not much to do in that state, especially in the winter. So you play basketball. And since there's not a lot to do in South Dakota anyway, um, 
sports is sports is really high on the totem pole when we think about schools. And so here I thought I was just king, right? Because I was a jock and I knew things. Now, I went back to my most recent high school reunion, and it was a long time after I graduated. I'll just give you that. So I thought I knew everybody because I was, you know. And what I found out is that individuals were introducing themselves to me. I, thought, I, I never knew them. I had no idea who they were. I thought they were married to some of my classmates. And sure enough, no, they were my classmates. Never knew them. And that's really what got me into this idea. So I began to start thinking about my own social network. And what we find is, again, picture yourself a, so, uh, a spider web. If you've ever seen a spider web, there's usually a center, right? Pretty strong center, pretty insulated when it comes to social networks. These are usually the high visibility students. What do you think they are? Could be athletes in some schools. What about the really high achieving schools? Who do you think they might be? Smart kids, right. Uh, my wife graduated from Walnut Hills. Any Walnut Hills graduates here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and she, she said to me, because we were talking about these findings, and she says, you know, it wouldn't be the athletes at Walnut Hills, because they usually don't have very good sports teams. It's usually these really smart individuals, Harvard bound, among other things. Those would be the ones in the middle. You know, it's really, it's fine about being in the middle. Problem is, you're pretty insular in that middle. Everybody recognizes you, but who you hang around with is pretty small and tight. Now, the reason I bring this up is if that one individual decides that he, want, he or she wants to partake in a risk behavior, what do you think the others in that group are, com are compelled to do? Why? What happens if they don't? What's the threat? Getting booted out, right? That power of social connection is so important even in the middle of that group, of that thing where everybody knows you. So I'm really focusing on the ones on the outside of the spider web. These are the ones that don't really get a lot of connections with each other. And for the longest time, we were really focusing on these children who are acting up in class, who are disruptive, or among other things. And I call them the active, active ostracized. And the reason I say this, you have the findings there, Socially ostracized because of disruptive behaviors is one, and we usually focus on them, and for rightly so. If they're disrupting class, we have to make peace in this class. We've got to do something about it. But there's another group, and I, this is where it was coming back to my high school reunion. I didn't know this, this classmate of mine, not because they were disruptive. I just didn't know them because they blended into the woodwork. They were the social wallflowers. And we forget about them by definition. And we often think that, well, maybe they're doing fine. But if you look at your outcomes, so I, this, in this one study, this has been replicated over and over again across different schools, um, different grade levels. I asked them not only to rate the very question I would have asked you, I asked them, but I also asked them to rate their own depression, their own social stress, among other things. You've seen, you see the findings? It's pretty small font, so my apologies. But... Who is, of the three groups, the socially adjusted, these kids were fine, they're connected well, these are the socially ostracized disruptive, and these are the socially ostracized passive, the social wallflowers. Who's the one that's struggling the most? Passive. Right, the passive. Take a look at the depression. Because they're afraid to ask questions. Could be a number of reasons why. But I'm going to highlight to you. This is, a, this, is a, this is an air of omission. I didn't include one variable up there. And the variable I didn't include was GPA, actual GPA. Who, of these three groups, which group has the highest GPA? The ostracized. Passive. So to us, parents and to teachers, what does this group really look like? The model student, they're doing great in school. They're not acting up. They're doing fine. Yeah, they might be a little shy. But the point about it is, again, this has been replicated. This is not just one study, it's multiple studies. Some of these kids might be really struggling. So please don't neglect and neglect it. If your child is having a hard time connecting, take it seriously. Make sense? As we go on. Okay. All right. So anxiety, stress, anxiety. Yeah. Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. Yeah, how do you, how do you determine 
Well, that's a good question. If they have a few close friends, then they're not ox they're not ostracized, and they're fine. It's the kids that don't have any friends. You know, they're kind of really on the outside looking in. Those are the ones we want to think about. They spend a lot of time. They're going to seek connections, um, and sometimes it's going to be electronic. Most of the time, it will. We will find ways to connect. By the way, you know, we think about these ostracized um, disruptors as loners. Well, I can tell you that's really not true. Yeah, they'll be booted out of the larger peer group, but who are they going to find to hang out with? The other, the other, <laughs> the other disruptors. So they kind of form connections, but they're just on the outside. They form cliques on the outside. So that's what happens. The ones that I want to focus on are those, those single isolates that have no connections. So you've got to get the skills that we can use Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anxiety in children, it's often overlooked. At one point, we thought there was no such thing as anxiety. This was back in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, distress like depression and anxiety and PTSD, among other things. Children couldn't experience, young children couldn't experience because they weren't cognitively enough. That's not true at all. They can experience. I'll walk you through it real quick here. But I do want to focus on a couple of these things, social anxiety disorder. For example, it's that irrational fear in the presence of social performance situations. Look, remember when I was talking about that red car, that time one red car where it carved a thing? Are all of us aware of all of our student, all of our children's time one experiences? No, it would be, be folly to think it. So sometimes when our child is overreacting, we think, you're really overreacting. We just may not have seen the time one experience. And one of the time one experiences, of course, is the presence of social or performance situation. Maybe they just completely fell flat on their face. And again, it's all about perceptions. It's not our perceptions, it's their perceptions. If they felt that they completely, dire, catastrophically failed, that is a time one experience. My time one experience may be happening right now. In high school, I was voted most likely to wet my pants in front of a parent group speaking about anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> so social anxiety disorder, this goes back to the puberty thing. We think that adolescent girls are slightly more prone to the disorder than boys. Um, again, because of perhaps some of the pubertal changes that happen with the, the hormone and particular structures of the brain that govern social cues. Females much more socially aware at that age, at the younger ages, than males are. Um, General anxiety disorder, excessive unrealistic worry and anxiety about a, a number of areas. It's really common in, in use, uh, ranging about 10%. So these things are not small, even 10%. We're talking about how many children in America? Millions of kids. So um, one of the things I do want to talk about real quick here is perfectionism. Uh, how many of you are perfectionistic or have a perfectionistic child? <laughs> You know, there's nothing wrong with being perfectionist. If I need a brain surgery, I want my doctor to be a perfectionist, right? But we used to think that perfectionism was a bad thing because it was destructive to have such high standards. But more and more of our research is showing there's actually two types of perfectionists. Both of them have equally high standards. I mean, really high standards in comparison to anything else. The adaptive perfectionist is able to accept when their performance doesn't match their standards. They use it as a learning experience. And they're driven by a sense of mastery. I'm learning. I know I'm going to screw up. But it doesn't get in the way of trying new things. Maladaptive perfectionists, on the other hand, cannot accept when their performance doesn't match their standards, which is pretty much all the time. And for that reason, they're dri not driven by a sense of mastery. They're driven by a sense of performing. They have to achieve. Does this make sense to anybody? OK, good. <laughs> So they'll do things actually to hijack it because they know that they're not going to reach their standards. They may not even do it. Procrastination is huge. My God, you're brilliant. How come you're not turning in your homework? You're so lazy. Well, maybe it's not laziness. Maybe they just know it's too much effort because I know it's not going to match it. So they're driven by a fear of failure. The goal for all of us is not to change our standards. Standards are fine. It's not the standards. It's the acceptance when they're not going to. One of the things I do with my students when I work with them is 
it, this has nothing to do with therapy. <laughs> nothing to do with it. It is getting them to be involved in a personal growth project. And their homework assignment for me is I want you to choose something that you've always wanted to do, but you've never had. Why don't you guys try that? I, this is great. I want you guys to be choose one thing you've never done yet, you've always wanted to do. No excuses, you gotta do it. Maybe it's picking up a new language or a musical instrument. Especially for those of you who said that you're perfectionists, this is gonna be very painful for you because you're going to fa fail in the way. But you're gonna learn something about this. More importantly, what we have found with families who are highly perfectionistic is that they don't admit failure. They don't wanna show failure. The very thing we want to have the student learn from. So uh, I, I worked with a family, and it was, it was wonderful for the parents to admit when they failed because they actually went out and failed and walked the student through how they're processing that, the very things that I'm, I was teaching them, the coping skills. And what we know is that this observation, observational learning is much more powerful than trying to teach them directly. Personal growth project it has to be ongoing. It has to be something that is a, a skill, and um, usually it's you know under a coach or whatever. But you got to fail. You got to learn how to fail, and that's one of the things we can do. So far, so good. How much more time you want to give me? I can keep going. Okay. Nobody's throwing fruit yet. More money. <laughs> How many of you are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder? I won't go more than 15 minutes. Good, PTSD. PTSD, again, is, again, like most of us, isn't just, uh, seriously considered and until about 1980. We didn't think they could possibly get it, but the prevalence rate is between four and seven. I want to address some myths about PTSD. One myth is that if you get it, you can't get rid of it. It's actually one of the most curable things, and I'll walk you through real quickly why that is. Number two is it only happens to those who are in like battle conditions, right? Only combat veterans get it. But what do you think is the most common reason to get PTSD? What's the most common reason, factor, way? Surprise, injury. Injury, accidents. Number one, think about car accidents. Is it more common to be in a car so that increases the probability of being in an accident or being in a wartime situation, right? So the prevalence is much higher for domestic issues. It's not to say that, of course, if you're in a combat situation, the chances of getting PTSD are a little bit higher. But the highest is always going to be something that's much more frequently experienced, accidents. Unfortunately, sexual assaults are number two. And they don't just happen to adults. So it, children can have it and they can get it and at a young age. I uh, just want to call out three core symptoms of PTSD. And the PTSD, it has to be a traumatic event. One can experience trauma, as I've shown you. PTSD is a diagnosable disorder. It's much more restricted in getting a diagnosis. And essentially, it is either you or somebody you've experienced or witnessed is exposed to a situation where they were either, either you or they were going to be either killed or seriously hurt. And that's all about perception. It may, you may not have been hurt, but if you perceive that, then that's the setting stage, the entry criteria to get PTSD. But even then, there are many, many individuals who have experienced trauma and don't get PTSD. There's other things that are happening, and it's much more current. Any reminders of the situation lead to uh, avoidance, symptoms of extreme arousal. So there's a certain criterion. The reason I bring this up is if you are suspecting your child or somebody that you know, give that call, 558-5872. I feel like a telephone. 558-5872, and we can help you. So, okay? More importantly, resilient classrooms, resilient homes. Resiliency is the key. Everybody's going to experience adversity. What can we do to help our child walk through it? So, and the reason I want to bring up resiliency is that when we think about school outcomes, it's not just our homework assignments. 50% of academic outcomes are associated from the neck up. All these resiliency factors that I'm listing, listing right here, we have to think about it. Well, how do we experience resiliency? And so I want to walk you through some things in the very short amount of time I have. Is this helpful? All right, is there anything 
Um, I can't change the physical presentation of, the, of this. I'm, I'm sorry. If you want, you can pretend I'm Brad Pitt. Um, I close my eyes. I pretend the same thing. So. Boy, I'm not getting a lot of good ones. <laughs> First things first, let's talk about what we, what we know that really works well in, in homes and increasing resiliency. And it's the importance of communication, right? The importance of communication. Yes, it's so cliche-ish. But in the 1980s, he's still around. Gerald Patterson is his name. And he's an incredibly respected researcher out of Oregon. And I think he's 192 years old right now. And he's, he's been around for quite some time. But he was one of the first ones to really look at functioning. And he was looking at families. And he was looking at factors that, that lead to a well-working family and a not-so-well-working family. And he found two factors. The first factor, let me ask you, <clears throat> what's your favorite movie? Oh, my goodness. This is going to be a long 15 minutes. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. OK, that's a good one. Sleepless in Seattle. Huh? Sleepless in Seattle. Um, is there any men in the audience? <laughs> good fellas, good. I like that. All right. <laughs> Anybody else? James Bourne. Bourne? Got it. If you notice, a good movie, the movie that you really resonates with you, there's really two reasons why it's so good. One is you got a great director. You got to have a good director. That director knows everything about that movie. He knows the pacing. Knows the thing. But fuck every actor knows that they have to follow in line with the director. You forget about that. You forget about when you were looking at that movie, it's just you know people reading lines on a blank sheet of paper. But they have their roles down so well that you get sucked into the story. So in a really good, well-working family, who's directing the movie? The parents, yeah. What do you think is happening in the not-so-well-working family? Who's directing the movie? <laughs> so the roles are flipped. The roles are flipped. So that was one of the things he was saying. But more importantly, and this is in the case of teaching resiliency and shaping resiliency, the ability to cope and work through whatever problem it is, it was the importance of communication. But it wasn't just communication. It was the kind of communication. And he got it down to a science. He saw in well-working families, for every time that the child was disciplined, they were caught being good five times. It was a five to one ratio. Five times for every one time that the child was being disciplined. Not like the child had, didn't, wasn't going to be disciplined, they were. But they just knew they were going to have to beef up that ratio even more. And it wasn't performance driven. Great job, Joey, you got an A. That wasn't it at all. It was these things we wanted to shape. So, how's your ratios? I'm going to print a t shirt and that's what's going to be. How's your ratios? Don't have to say it, but oftentimes in not so well working families, what do you think that ratio is? Negative. Yeah, it's usually if you're lucky if you got one, right? It's usually flipped. So one of the things we want to do is just keep the five to one ratio in mind. When you're saying something that's all right, they're not doing that very well. What's the opposite of what do you really want them to do? Catch them being good, and you have to verbally reward them for that. Don't take it for granted, verbally war. It is amazing the power of human speech. There are, again, in our brains, they are programmed for human speech. We want to hear it. So that's one. Five to one ratio. Just focus on what you want to do on that one. But more importantly, let's talk about when your child is starting to escalate. Oh, when that train is about to leave the station. And how many of you try to talk them down? Try to? Good, good. And how effective is it? <laughs> let's try something else. This is the audience participation of the, of the thing. I'm not going to let you get away with this without at least trying something, all right? Wow, you're really looking really <laughs> excited about this. It's not a big deal. I just want you to relax. Just sit up straight. Just please relax. Just relax. Relax your shoulders. And all I want you to do is simply take a breath. Get as much air in your lungs as you possibly can. And when you've done that, give me a finger. Not the finger. Give me a finger all the way up. And take two more breaths more until your lungs literally hurt you and let it go don't hold your breath that's dangerous and it doesn't have to be slow here's the problem with breathing when I ask audiences do you breathe yeah I do does it work not really and the reason is we don't breathe the right way we have to breathe until this gets we have to make our lungs hurt and it doesn't matter how fast you are 
I want you just to relax and try to make your, your breath, your breath, your lungs hurt three times in a row. Try it. Because I want you to get I need to get something to drink. Make it hurt. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't work. We do this with marching band. You do marching band, good. Yeah, we, we, we teach the kids to breathe until it hurts, you know. You're, you're ahead of the curve. If you want, you can close your eyes, pretend you're looking at a light bulb. And the reason I'm saying this is that it helps you focus on something. As your breath is getting more and more up, that light bulb is getting so bright, you can't think of anything else. Try three times in a row. How many of you actually got three times? About 10% is usually. All right. Why am I making your lungs hurt besides I like pain? Why is that? Yeah, you bring it up, yeah. Right. Remember that evolutionary thing I was telling you about the connections? I don't have it back here, but the brainstem, the emotion, follow up real quickly. Brainstem starts to buzz. What's happening now? What's going to happen? It's going to make a connection to your emotions, and your emotions are going to tell your frontal lobe to what? Not think, shut down. We have to hijack this part right here to keep that baby going. If I make your lungs hurt, what, am, what are we literally forcing your brain stem to do? Right? Your brain stem is not very uh, complex. It's going to focus on the most proximal of the threats. If you can override it, especially if you can catch your child starting to escalate and just say, I'm not going to talk to you. We're going to stop and breathe. We're going to stop and breathe. And you're going to do it with them. And you're going to make it hurt. It has to hurt. What's going to happen is that that brainstem is going to go, what in the world? And it's going to focus on the pain in the lungs. And when that happens, that connection to the emotional center is now severed. The frontal lobe automatically comes online. You're just hijacking the evolutionary process to your advantage. Try it. Powerful stuff. Now, your, your, your child is not going to be used to this. <laughs> so you've got to keep practicing with them. But this is the skill you can teach them. Yep. Yeah. yeah, they're expecting. Remember, this is another thing about Patterson, too, is that we all are doing this thing. We all have parents. We all know what our dad did. On, uh, if I do this, he's going to do this because it's manual nine. If I do this, my mom's going to do this, and she's on manual or page number 12 in her manual. We knew exactly what to expect for parents when we did something. They're expecting you to do that. They're expecting you to go, me to go, oh, I don't want to hear about it. And what are they expecting you to do? Yeah, it, they're expecting that. That's the manual, right? What you want to do is give them nothing. Don't give them any emotion. Give them nothing because they have to have an absence. Have you ever done one of those things? How many of you have ever had a father, by the way, who gave you the look? Maybe it was a mom, just the look. How many of your parents scared the living daylights out of you when they did that? You had no idea what was coming next. The absence of communication, we often don't think about, but the absence of communication is a powerful teaching moment for our students or her children, it's because they don't know what's coming next. And the next thing we want to remind them is, we're going to breathe. You're going to model exactly what you want with them. And you're going to breathe with them. It's very physical, and the reason is, you, yeah, the grounding techniques, I'm not a big, um, okay, I'm not, I should have said that, I should say that differently. There are some of us who are just not big fans of it, because we're asking them, name three things, what are we trying to engage them to do? Think, but they're not thinking, right? Because, yeah, you do that, I do that sometimes too, you know, I'll, th I'll throw out a cockamated question at my kid, and, and if they're listening to you, they'll go, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. Most of the time when they're really escalated, what are they actually focusing on? The negative tape loop. They're not even listening to you at that point. So there's another way of doing it, and that's the breathing. It seems to be much more effective. But again, if it doesn't hurt them, it's not going to work. Um, the, the other thing is, um, what was I talking about? Uh, yeah, the social connection is very important. How many of you are dealing with students right now who are parent, uh, children right now who are struggling socially? How many of they, uh, how many of them are involved in other things besides school? How important is it? 
The things that they're involved in, by the way, are they performance driven? Sports. And what I'm what, what research is also suggesting is get them involved in something that's um, uh, process driven, not, not uh, performance driven. So I have this happen a lot with my parents that I work with. Well, we yeah, they're involved in sports, but if you think about it, we've all played sports perhaps, or for those of us who have, when we're in a sports situation, are we really focused on social connections? We're focused on the ultimate, right? Either winning the team or whatever else. So there's not a way to really practice the social skills we want them to do. The idea is to get them involved in mastery moments, something that's completely different than an athletic competition. And you're focusing on a process. And usually, it's involving them in some other social activity. There's plenty of other things that we can do in this community. And I love this community up here because there are a number of things up here. OK, I promised you 8.15, but I want to make sure I got question, uh, time for questions. Examples of what you were just talking about. Social activity? Mastery. You know, one of the great things about um, your libraries is they have a lot of things that you can get involved in. Your students can get involved, and if they don't, they have resources to help. So it could be anything from what are we having our kids involved in now? Theater. Yeah. Yeah. How many of you have children who are who have a, are suspected of having ADHD? Are you familiar with CHADD, Chad? CHADD, Chad, it's a, it's a group for adults. No, I'm, I'm coming back to you because you don't have to have a child with ADHD to get involved with that group. That's what they specialize in. But I will say, I've lived in a number of cities. The northern Cincinnati chapter of Chad is one of the best in the nation. You can look it up online. And they have a lot of social activities that kids can get involved in. And you don't have to, again, you don't have to have ADHD to be a part of that. So that's another way to look at it. But the great thing about up here is you've got a lot of resources to help you out. You don't have to solve it. And the thing about it is, as parents, don't identify for them. Have your child identify what they want to be involved in. Now they may go, I don't want to do it. You're going to reward them by, by finding the one and sticking with them. Other questions? Careful of your stress levels. Obviously, you have to take care of yourself. The very things I'm showing you are the very things you can do now. So, how many of you have adolescents? All right. Can I spend five minutes with you? Because we've talked about the breathing. But let's talk about when they tell you their negative table. Oh, God, those are ugly thoughts, aren't they? How many of you are familiar with Socrates? Good, all right, Socrates, right? I bet you didn't think you were gonna get a Socrates lesson tonight. Socrates, of course, is considered the father of Western philosophical thought. If I was to take you 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years ago in the past, we're all wearing togas, hanging out, and I'm an ugly guy, I got, I got a weird nose, and I smell, because I don't really take good care of myself, and I ask these annoying questions. And one of the questions I ask you, I say, hey, what moves, the earth or the sun? Do you know where we're moving right now as we speak about 17,500 miles an hour? Can you feel it? No. But there is, is something that's moving. It starts in the east, goes over the sky, sets in the west. So if I ask you that question, what moves, what's the center of the universe, the earth or the sun, what would you say? The earth, right? And I would say, are you sure? What would you say? Oh, yeah. yeah. You're using evidence, your evidence, your frame of reference to support that. So we came up with a thought experiment. You ready for the thought experiment? Let's say you were born in a cave. You've been chained to a cave. You've been looking at the back of the cave. There's a fire that's projecting your shadow. You've never seen what you've looked at. You've never even seen anybody. You've just seen your shadow. And one day I walk in and I say, what do you look like? What are you going to base what you look like on? So, describe yourself. What do you look like? Ugly, misshapen, pretty tall. And I ask you the same question. Are you sure? Or what would you say? You know what I do then? I do something really crazy. I flash a mirror in front of you and I say, now what do you look like? What are you going to base what you look like on now? 
after you're done freaking out. After you're done freaking out, yeah. After you're done freaking out, you're going to base it on the mirror. What does that shadow mean to you now? Nothing. It means nothing. But it did. It did until that point when you gave him a different perspective. When I showed you a different perspective, your life has been based on your knowledge of the shadow. What do you think your negative tape loop is? It's all shadows. Right? It's all shadows. We don't know whether it's true or whether it's not. The idea of those automatic thoughts is rather than letting your, your child run with them and not challenging them, I want you to do two things. It's, all, it's called Socratic questioning. And remember at the beginning stages when I said, I'm going to teach you some things that we do in therapy. You don't have to be a therapist to do it. It's really two simple questions. First question is evidence for. All right, give me the evidence. Give me the evidence for that this is true. What you're doing is you're feeding their fire. Let them, let them tell you all the pieces of evidence to support what they just told you. And it may be pretty ugly stuff. Let them say it. Evidence for. So if I, you start with evidence for, you're going to be lucky if you get two or three actual pieces of facts. Because usually it's how they feel. And just pretend you're a judge. I need evidence to support what you just told me. I'm never going to get another date. I'm never going to get into Harvard. I just failed this math test. Okay. Tell me evidence that you're not going to get into Harvard. What am I showing? What are you doing at this point? Am I talking you down? No. No. Tell me evidence. Now, if I've done that, if I have done the evidence for, what am I going to do next? Evidence, evidence against. And what do you think evidence against is? the BS rule. It's all the evidence to suggest that's not true. It's not talking somebody out of it. It's using facts. It's using the mirror just to expand the perceptions. You ready for this? Let's see if I can do this, all right? This actually happened to me, so I'm going to find my center. I'm going to go back into this moment where I felt really horrible. Ready? Terry Teague broke up with me. I'm never going to love again. That's actually what I told Nobody loves me. Come on, Mom. <laughs> Terry T broke up. <laughs> Terry T broke up with me. This is good. I haven't been in theater in some time. <laughs> Nobody loves me. I'm really getting upset. I'm really getting... I, should I breathe? Should I breathe till it hurts? <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing we're going to do, we see if they start to get upset, what are you going to do? I'm going to talk to you until we breathe. Simple. I do this all the time. All right. Terry T. just broke up with me. Nobody loves me. Why do you say that? I don't know. I just feel like it. You mean my evidence for? Oh, I loved her. She was great. She told me she loved me. Until she, she, she broke up with me. She says she didn't love me anymore. I, I don't. Nobody's gonna love me anymore. Well, I can give you another piece of evidence too. <laughs> you wanna you wanna exhaust the evidence for before you get to the evidence against because if you don't exhaust all evidences for that one rock that wasn't on the overturn. About a half hour from now, they're going to go, oh, yeah, I remember this one, too. Yeah. Josie also says she didn't love me. So you got to keep going. All right, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Give me another evidence for her. It's almost like you're leading with your chin, and you're getting them to learn, all right, what is the evidence for? What am I doing? I know it sounds kind of like, what in the world? But what are you getting them to do by these questions? Think. That's what they're doing. They're thinking. They're getting it back online. So... Let's go back to the evidence against. All right, the evidence against. You know that Josie person who broke up with me? You want to learn anything more about that? Like how old I might have been? All right, I was in the second grade. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want to know about these two breakups that I listed that nobody loves me? Why did they break up with you? I what? I don't think they just said they don't break up with me. Can you want to think about it? Are these the only two people that I've ever dated? 
Did I ever break up with somebody? I broke up with three girls. Yeah, I did. Two of which I said I didn't love anymore. Boy, may they gaga about me. <laughs> Do you see what I'm doing? I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to convince anybody. They're convincing themselves using their own evidence. That's Socratic questioning. By the way, you do it all the time. Have you ever gone out to a bar and your friends said something just like, what? And you catch them on it? That's Socratic questioning. You're actually using these very techniques. You just haven't applied them maybe to your, your, your child, but you can. Very effective stuff. Is this helpful at all? I'm not trying to make you therapist 101, but there are some very things that you can do in the comfort of your own home that can de-escalate and teach them the very skills that we've been talking about at the beginning of this hour and a half ago. The very skills, critical thinking, personal accountability, working through problems, all these things can be done with these simple steps, among others. What do you do if they don't want to breathe because they know it's going to take them out of the moment? Well, it depends on your next move. Your next move can either reinforce avoidance, or it can say, I'm not dealing with this. We well, come to discuss this when you're ready to do this. But there's that five to one. If you can continue to praise and continue to practice when even they're not practicing, you know, just, <laughs> I used to do this to my kids all the time. We're doing something, hey, let's do a breathe. You know, they don't realize what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to just prep them for when they actually need it. Because it's not going to come easy. It's all they're going to do is breathe when they need it. So. It, your, it's your move that's going to dictate whether they continue with that behavior or they don't. So the second part, the tell me evidence of mental blame. Or, like if the kids can't even go there, like they can't come up with the uh, proof. Does it come from their parents or like, well, let's... Yeah, oh yeah, help them out. You know their lives, right? My mom knew that I broke up with three girls. Didn't you break up with three girls yourself? I thought you said that you, they loved you. You broke up with them. They loved you. I don't understand this one. All you're trying to do is reflect the mirror back to them and get them to start making connections. Maybe it's not as bad as I thought. You have been wonderful. It's been 8.30. I know I kept you for an hour. Just out for my pay. <laughs> I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.